and wh what a better way to start than with our learning objectives. So take a glance up, up there. I'm sure you all read these beforehand as well. And our wonderful presenters. So I'm going to introduce each of our presenters uh, this evening before they speak, but I just want to go around the table to make sure you uh, each get familiar with their names. So starting at my far end, we have Dave Edwards, David Wirtel, Chris Curley, Divya, and forgive me, I want to be sure I pronounce your last name correctly. Let me make sure I have it, have it to read. Vijayanan Dakumar. I, I, please, please take no offense. I was practicing because I knew this moment was going to happen. So, so glad to have you. And lastly, Philip Newman. Welcome. And so, with that, let's give a quick, uh, a quick little uh, debrief into Passive House. So, Passive House is is an extension of so much of what you learn in school, right? In terms of uh, good passive solar principles, and it and it extends beyond to, to really focus on the building envelope. Uh, when it comes to the building envelope, there are you know so many facets that, that we uh, deal with, both interior and exterior. Um, and there are some of the familiar aspects, like controlling uh, the energy demands, uh, higher performing windows, heat recovery. And there are some elements that, at least for me, are, we're a little bit less familiar as we're starting to focus in on this. And those are controlling air changes and leakage and thinking about how, how leaky or tight your building envelope is. Uh, and avoiding thermal bridging, right? Trying to get this, this fancy color-coded uh, image of what your wall assembly looks like to understand, you know, how, how is that really performing? So these are things we have to start thinking about. Um, it's about leveraging the sun, one of those great resources that we probably don't uh, use enough, uh, or maybe uh, in the right ways, right? Proper shading helps and proper shading hurts, keeping that in mind, and going uh, from uh, macro to micro. Uh, it starts with uh, building uh, siding and orientation um, and then thinking about where our openings are located relative to the sun. What energy are we welcoming into the building or not welcoming into the building? And using surrounding trees, surrounding fenestration to continue to control that and, and mitigate that. Um, continuing this kind of ideology or, or example rather of, of a window, right? You want to pick the right performing uh, products, but then you don't that's not enough, right? You don't want to just put them on the right facade and just pick the right product, but you want to be sure you're applying it correctly and, and detailing it correctly. So being cognizant of where in that wall assembly is it. And this uh, pretty color-coded diagram is, uh, is really indicating that that middle, that middle zone right there is, is where it's going to work best. And it, it might, may fail, might, might cause a little more thermal bridging if you wanted to locate it more to the interior exterior. Thinking, thinking on this uh, micro scale as much as the macro scale is really important. And there's a lot to measure. Um, you know, these spreadsheets aren't aren't maybe unfamiliar to us, but it's helpful to maybe step up, step back a moment and think about, hey, what what do I need to keep in mind? And we have things like the climate that we're in, the R values of our different materials, the the areas and components and so on. Lots of things to think about and track, but it's best to keep in mind of those buckets uh, at a really high level. And lastly, as we kind of segue into the project that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, you can take a look at some of these uh, metrics to understand like where we're, where you might be at with a standard co-compliant home relative to a passive house built home or a passive house built project. You're going to need to see higher levels of insulation in your floors, walls, roofs, uh, higher uh, R-rated um, uh, windows, higher insulation in your windows, uh, or higher performing windows rather, um, less air changes, less leakage. Um, and as a result, you're going to see a much higher performing uh, building at a marginally a higher cost, which we're going to learn a lot more about through this project in particular. So with that, I am going to introduce our first speaker, David Wirtel. So David had some uh, Tesla stock options and therefore fancied he was uh, qualified to commission the design and construction of a three bedroom custom home that we'll be looking at here in a sec. Um, he's recovering from the trauma of his error by going back <laughs> to the office and working on things he knows something about which is developing software that wirelessly updates uh, all Tesla car and energy storage products. His words, not mine. Anyway, so with that, let me pass it off to David. All right, uh, can yeah, I just yeah. use this one? Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, forgive me as I look at this device. Unlike my teenager, I am not watching TikTok while talking to you. 
<laughs> this is where my notes are. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, in uh, October 2020, uh, my family and I bought a property uh, uh, near a park that, uh, that we like. Uh, this, there's, there it is on the map. Um, and one of the, and we, it has a really old house that we're going to tear down. Uh, it's about 100 years old. It was a, a hunting shack for some rich guy who lived in the area. Um, but, uh, and so it was totally unusable and we're going to rebuild. Uh, one of my concerns was indoor air quality. Every year uh, we have wildfires all over California resulting in polluted air leaking into our house and we have to set up uh, air purifiers in every room. And I figured if we're going to build a house, let's build it so that we don't have to do that all the time. Um, I also uh, spent a, a lot of time working at home in uh, uh, my home office uh, uh, during COVID. And I bought a, a CO2 meter just to kind of see, you know, when these, when I've closed my doors to all the smoke outside, mm -hmm. what's happening to the CO2 inside. And I was kind of shocked that uh, uh, the levels were pretty high and I didn't even know it until I measured it, but uh, unhealthy levels of CO2 building up in, in my house. Um, so uh, I figured uh, maybe I could do something about that in the new house as well by uh, having some kind of ventilation. Um, but even more than the air quality, I was, I was worried about noise uh, from Caltrain. The, the property is right on the Caltrain tracks. Let's see. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it there, but uh, it's like my bedroom is going to be 25 feet from the tracks. Um, and uh, I, I live about a half a mile from this place, and I've recorded uh, the sound of the train going by. Uh, and it's, it's about 30 decibels, which uh, is very quiet. Uh, I, I think of it as a, a kind of a, a, a forlorn wistful sort of sound, um, but it's not going to be forlorn and wistful in this new location. Um, so uh, exposure to prolonged or excessive noise has been shown to cause a range of health problems. Uh, excessive noise sets off the body's uh, acute stress response. The EPA recommends indoor noise levels of 45 decibels or lower. So asking around, I have a friend uh, I found lives on a busy street who uh, remodeled his uh, room, his bedroom. He wanted to soundproof it from the noise outside. He's a light sleeper. A light sleeper. So he did a lot of research. He's <clears throat> kind of nerdy that way like me. And he used double walls and triple pane windows and all, all of the techniques uh, for soundproofing. And um, I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some of that in my new house as well. Um, let's see here. Another, another thing that I picked up, uh, while thinking about the house is my, my father lives in Vermont, uh, a cold place was living in an antique house, 125 years old, that was really leaky. And, and he, uh, did a lot of work to, uh, to, to seal it. He, he, he didn't use the word passive house, but he kind of built a passive house in his house by, thickening all the insulation, sealing off all of the walls and, uh, and installing an ERV. Uh, and so uh, that also kind of inspired me is his house was very quiet on the inside and uh, also had really great air um, in spite of the, you know, uh, whatever uh, pollution that was going on over there. So I, I thought I'd like one of those things too. Uh, and I researched all these technologies and techniques and I found uh, that the, the term passive house kept popping up. Um, and so uh, I started searching for passive house builders because I thought, okay, maybe I can get all of these things that I want with a passive house builder. And uh, I eventually uh, came across uh, this FIAS website, uh, which had a big directory of, uh, of builders and met Steve Mann, who uh, referred me to uh, Dave Edwards and said, he's, he's your guy. Uh, and I, I, uh, I knew that he built custom houses and that was going to be kind of a, a, a premium of cost, but I figured if I could afford it, that it would, it would be, 
it'd be worth it for the for the health benefits. Uh, and so uh, this is these are the requirements that I, I sent an email to Dave with uh, about two years ago when we had just purchased the property. And pretty much these uh, are the requirements that I've kept to this day. The, the square footage has grown a little bit. Uh, it's almost 6,000 now, but the rest of the, uh, the rest of the things that I wanted uh, at that time were still are the things that we're gonna build into the house. So um, I had a lot of phone conversations with Dave and I, I learned a little bit about how the process goes. And he says, uh, so who's your architect? And I said, well, I haven't, I haven't found a good one yet because I've been looking at all these passive houses online and they all look like, uh, like featureless cubes. And uh, I was you know, wondering how, uh, if there were, was an option to get a beautiful house. And he, so he introduced me to a few uh, uh, architects that, that he liked and, and Feldman was one of them. Um, and uh, none of the architects that, I, uh, that he introduced me to really had uh, a house that they could show me that was this was this is a passive house that we built, but of all of them, it, I kind of got the feeling that Feldman had the style that I want, and they they gave me the confidence that they could build uh, a, a house with these features in it, and so I I eventually went with Feldman. Glad I did, and so one of the things that Feldman uh, recommended was to uh, go with a an expert to. Uh, uh, measure the environmental noise and to pr uh, propose mitigation features in the house. And so we did that. The, uh, the uh, acoustics team measured the noise using a calibrated device. Uh, and they found that the train horn was the loudest component of the noise. And, and uh, it was uh, about 109 decibels on the property, which is very high. Um, the, uh, I actually went out and purchased the same monitor that they used to do the measurement. And I, uh, I set it up for a week. And I found that uh, once a week, at least once during that week, at least, the sound level on the property reached 120 decibels. Mm. And, these, and, and there's you know, people living all in, up and down this track. I, I don't know how they stand it. Um, but the neighbors told me that we'd get used to it. Mm. <laughs> They, they said our, our guests would not get used to it. Um, uh, and I had visions of my 85-year-old mother-in-law uh, bolting out of bed at 5.30 in the morning, <laughs> jumping out of her skin. And uh, I didn't relish the effect that that would have on family har harmony. Um, there are really no construction techniques that can bring 120 decibels down to healthy levels. Um, but fortunately, 120 decibels only happens about once a week, and it's usually in the day um, and, and not in the ni at night. Uh, and the consultants predicted that uh, given that the, the common case is about 105 decibels, uh, they could, we could bring it down to uh, about 55 decibels in the bedroom, at least. So noise isolation is uh, about finding the weakest link. And in the case of a bedroom, the weakest link is always the window. Uh, different materials have different uh, abilities to attenuate noise and the ability is measured in sound transmi transmission class or STC. Uh, this is basically, the, the STC is basically the number of decibels that a material can reduce the, uh, the noise when you use it. Um, I wanted STC 60, but they don't make windows like that. The best you can kind of get out of a window, practically speaking, is about 35 decibels, um, at least on a, on a big window like I wanted to have. Um, but uh, I also was planning to have a big basement, and I thought, okay, well, I can shield them from some of the noise by putting the guest room downstairs. Um, I stayed in basement bedrooms before and uh, they've all been small and uncomfortable. Uh, so I'm hoping to make this one uh, less uncomfortable by having a, a big uh, light well that reaches down to it um, and to have high ceilings as high as we can for the basement. Um, now, having a big light well with a big window uh, increases the size of a low STC material for 
the guest room, which is a question, you know, is that going to be, it's going to be underground, but it's going to have this big window. Is it actually going to be comfortable in there when the train goes by? And we don't know. Uh, we won't know until we try. Um, so uh, I've learned a few things about uh, the limitations of Passive House and uh, the process of going through this design. Uh, uh, one thing I learned is you basically need full custom. You, you, can't, uh, you can't get a factory uh, build that does Passive House uh, uh, and all of the features that I wanted. Um, gas appliances are, are not allowed. Um, I originally uh, planned to include a workshop and a garage uh, in the Passive House envelope, but uh, I've been advised not to mix the air from these rooms uh, in, with the living space. Separating them makes the design more complex uh, because you have to minimize the piercings through the envelope. Um, building a custom home has been a really new experience for me. And, uh, I'm used to building electronics in factories, and I figured that some of that experience would translate. I've designed a lot of products, but, uh, but it really hasn't. <laughs> in manufacturing, you have uh, lots of chances to prototype and test before you build mm. the final product, uh, but you can't do that when building a custom home. And, uh, and in fact, uh, a lot of the sort of technologies that I wish that I could use are not really available uh, Yet, um, I wish I could have open source uh, light controls. Uh, uh, those don't exist for a custom home. I'm going to have to build them myself. Uh, and that's, I think that's uh, scaring some of the people on my team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that's OK. I, I can take the risk. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, they can too. Um, that's, that's all I've got. Thank you, David. I did have to laugh at that last slide, things I've learned because everything you've been talking about for the last 10 minutes were things that we've all kind of learned and developed along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and if you haven't noticed, um, Dave has been very, very, very involved in this project, every aspect. Um, his passion has pushed all the teams um, to places we weren't expecting. Um, and it's been, it's been really rewarding. Um, this is far and away the most technically challenging project I've ever worked on. Um, so just so you guys know, David's the homeowner and Chris is the architect. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we've been pushed in a lot of different directions. Um, and, you know, I, I think this has been a big team effort and collaboratively we've, we've landed at a really great thing. Um, my name's Chris Curley. I think it said Christopher. Um, my mother is the only person that calls me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll let uh, Alex hop in here. I'm glad you gave me the heads up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Chris Curley here, primary designer and partner at Feldman Architecture. He's a lead GA, holds his uh, uh, building sciences and architecture from uh, Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute from New York. Joined Feldman back in 2011, became an owner and partner in 2015, and with 20 years of involvement in design, in design and construction across a broad range of project types and scales, uh, his work has emphasized uh, single-family custom homes, but has also included wineries, hospitality projects, and master planning. Uh, Chris is adept at realizing all aspects of a project, from the smallest detail to how a building interacts with this environment. The value of a defined process is ultimately to ensure that conceptual ide ideas result in client-driven, human-centered spaces that are appropriate to, to their context, and I think this project is certainly a testament to that. Uh, his work eschews fashion, uh, and instead of striving for design solutions that aspire to stand the test of time, uh, it's a, a balance of prag pragmatism and delight. Uh, Chris leads several office initiatives, including staff mentoring uh, and continuing to evolve uh, the team, the firm's uh, marketing and communication endeavors. Uh, his award-winning work can be found in numerous uh, publications, both domestically and internationally, uh, including Dwell, Lux, Architectural Digest, uh, El Decor, among others. Uh, that I'm sure you all may recognize. Um, and his office is an AIA 2030 commitment signatory since 2016. So with that, all yours, Chris. Thanks, Alex. Um, 
So they told me there were going to be a bunch of designers in here today. So I figured I could start with a plan, which I was really excited about. Because um, usually it's just <laughs> show me the pretty pictures. Um, acoustics on this project, certainly the most difficult challenge. Um, Passive House is very complementary to dealing with acoustics. Um, outer relation is required uh, throughout the entire structure. Um, it's really... Uh, attuned to kind of uh, thermal bridging, avoiding thermal bridging, uh, which is also an acoustical bridge. Um, um, the the site itself was actually, I would say, very complementary to Passive House. I think the neighborhood itself is all single story, um, which really helped us be strategic and minimal with um, fenestration. Um, it's also a narrow lot, um, which we have a two car garage, which let us put the car in the garage and gave us very minimal, um, uh, facade to kind of have to deal with that was street facing. Um, it's also a mid, mid block, um, uh, lot. So both sides, we have neighbors on both sides. So we had to be really conscious and strategic about where window placements were for that. Um, so the big thing for us was we didn't really have that many opportunities for a lot of windows. Um, we had a main street elevation that we had to make a pretty garage, which I think we, I think we did. Um, and then we could focus on the entrance and kind of highlight some of the natural features of the house, which um, were some, uh, there's a, a big cypress in the front yard and then also some adjacent redwoods. So the front of the house here is page right on the street and then the, the property line in the back is um, immediately adjacent to Caltrain. Um, the Caltrain, the tracks themselves are elevated um, about 10 feet above the, the, the backyard. So noise level is above your head and it just kind of blankets um, the home. Um, so from, um, I guess I can control this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, they said don't ask for next slide. Um, so the, you can see the car, the, the two car garage in the front here and then the main entry path that comes in to uh, an outdoor covered um, uh, veranda. Um, the main entry um, and the, the, the first floor basically has the two main bedrooms. Um, and then the, the, the third bedroom, the guest bedroom is on the lower level. Um, so it's essentially mostly all public space on this ground level. Um, um, I would say the program was probably the second most challenging thing in this project because we had a lot of program. Um, Dave has a lot of hobbies. Um, <laughs> um, and um, uh, his wife Tomoko works from home um, that does uh, upholstery. So we have an upholstery studio. Um, on the main level because there's the access requirement for that. So um, the plan um, was in terms of the organization, you know, we have public and then private in the back. And that, that was almost a given, like there, there weren't too, too many things that we could do on the ground level here. So um, what we tried to do um, with locating the bedrooms in the back was to buffer buffer that as much as possible from the, um, from the train noise. So in the bedrooms, you'll see there's either bathrooms or closets. Um, windows were pretty strategic um, in, in those rooms as well. Um, we have a great room uh, that's there centered in the middle of the home uh, with living, dining, uh, and kitchen. And that opens up into kind of the big moment of the house. This is kind of the great room and we have um, a double height space here that opens up uh, North, well, that's, that's Project North. North is actually kind of up into the right-hand corner um, of the building. So it's the, the great room faces west. Um, this was the side, um, which was kind of fortuitous. This, this is the side that we wanted to get the most afternoon light, uh, evening light. Um, and it's also the, the, the side that is less... Um, impacted by the train noise, but just a little. Um, but at 105 decibels, every decibel counts. Um, 
And that entire uh, patio structure on the side there um, is, uh, has a, a covered shading solution, a retractable shade solution there. Um, um, this is the basement. Um, so uh, the guest bedroom is in the back of the home to the left. Um, immediately to its right is a light well. Um, then where the number one is, this is, uh, we call it the playroom. Um, it's kind of a multi-purpose room, family room. There's table tennis. Notice I didn't say ping pong. <laughs> um, we're serious. Table tennis. Uh, we have a poker table. Uh, and then we kind of have uh, a theater seating system. Um, uh, and then adjacent to it is the second light well. So all of the spaces on this side of the house um, um, get that uh, the natural light from, from above. And these are all largely floor to ceiling windows here. Um, uh, let's see, we do have a, a two story, we'll call it garage, but it's really storage uh, at the lower level. Um, we do have a lift. Um, uh, the, the space number three is Dave's studio or playroom, um, <laughs> in which we have a brewery, a spray booth, a full wood shop, and then, you know, then the actual work area. Um, so there's a lot going on in that. That was a real challenge. The I'm simulator. sure Philip forgot the will, flight simulator. Oh, the flight simulator. That's right. Um, <laughs> um, how could I forget? Um, <laughs> Uh, and then we have just mechanical space. Um, and you'll see that, it, which is actually quite small, I think, for, mm -hmm. for this house. Now, some of the pretty pictures. Uh, so this is the front elevation. Um, you know, we, um, we had to make something of the garage. Uh, this, um, uh, this is basically street facing. Um, there, there are no sidewalks in this neighborhood. So everyone that kind of passes in front is um, uh, walking on the street. Um, so there are these just quick, quick moments and these quick glimpses into these lots. Um, the main entrance to the house is on the left side there. Um, we've used, um, for this we're using a, I don't, I don't want to push it again, this is Shogi. Shoshugiban. 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 Thank you. Uh, that's actually a silver. It's, it's quite beautiful. And then we're using a, um, a beige um, secondary tone as, as kind of a complementary color um, that happens. Um, we have Tesla solar roof that really did not want to work with us, but Dave <laughs> fought them to the end. Um, so as far as I know, we're, we're going to get that. This will be our first project that we've um, done this on. Um, and this is the great room of the house um, that opens out to the side, the side patio. Um, this is the most important acoustic, this was the most challenging thing both from Passive House and from the acoustical co components of the, um, or the acoustical requirements for the house. Um, uh, thermal bridging is a, is a big deal. All of the steel structure that was required for this was had to be in board. Um, we do have steel in the, in the ceilings here that um, is all is isolated through layers of insulation, both um, surrounding it and above it. Um, these are some more views. This is um, looking straight in from the patio. Looking out, this is the main kind of view area. We're going to take a poll if people like one or two chandeliers over the dining room table. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> um, we've had a lot of a lot of people opine on that one. Um, and then this is um, looking towards the the seating area. Um, let's see. I feel like that's. That is my last slide. That's it from a design standpoint. Awesome. Oh, I think on to Philip. So Philip Newman here. He's an he is an HVAC designer of his uh, namesake firm, Philip Newman Energy Design. Uh, he's an environmental designer, general contractor, uh, project manager, and consultant to architects, builders, and homeowners. Uh, his experience is in designing uh, unique environments with superior comfort, reduced waste, 
uh, and harnessing our natural resources to achieve these ends sustainably. Uh, he is at his best when problem solving, bridging gaps between owners and occupants, engineers and architects, and builders and craftsmen. I think he's certainly in good company here. Uh, and boy, does he have a long list of accolades here. And uh, just, to, just to pick out a few real quick, uh, HERS Raider, Greenpoint Raider, uh, certified technical PV technical sales uh, certifications. Uh, Owen, he went to uh, school at UC Davis for a Bachelor of Science uh, in Design. Um, uh, has a construction management uh, background from UC Berkeley as well. And gosh, that's that's just a few of them. But <laughs> with that, take it away. So I, my role is uh, support to everybody. I feel like I should be, I, I'm sort of a tool. And <laughs> I, 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 I work words. best when I'm in with a great team that really works as a team. And we we've had some vigorous discussions between us and Dave, Dave and David and Dave and David, you know, will say um, there are some project goals, tactile project goals that David, you saw on his list. Warm floors was a very high priority. David said a passive house, it will never turn on, you know, and so how do we bridge that gap? So my role was to come up with a plan, a low energy plan that could implement everybody's goals. And fortunately, we now have equipment that can operate at all different levels. So I crunch numbers and I look at obscure things and then I come back to the team and I say, well, you know, this room is having its load at this period of time. This room is having its high load at this period of time. So we add it all up and we can act, we can reduce our total load by 20%, whatever. But let's have the discussion of, do we want to cover 100%, 100% of the time? Of course we do. Everybody wants every, everything. But sometimes we don't have the money to pay for everything. But how do you accomplish that? So now we have equipment that we can dedicate, we can shift that load to that room. And we can say, because you know, um, part of the passive house um, uh, perspective is, is harnessing some of these natural resources. So glass that reduces conduction loads, but at the right time, allows solar gain in the summertime when you want it, you know, is, is important. But you can't always shade it perfectly. You can't always orient it. Sometimes you have a fabulous west view and our west views, those loads are up September, October. And unless you put a tree in front of it, in front of your view, you're never gonna shade that window. So you're gonna have a load that goes you know, like one of these, boing. So, and you have a wall of glass that, you know, you have to deal with. So fortunately, we stay on top of everything that's been going on in the industry. Fortunately, California is a real force to be reckoned with that creates markets for companies that are willing to stick their neck out and say, oh, well, yeah, we have a market to sell these things. We can develop, we can pay for R&D. So again, I, so I feel like I'm in a total support role of trying to make everything on the back of the house be invisible, but support comfort and utility. I always tell, you know, my first, every time I meet a new mechanical contractor, you know, my first thing I say to them is you have the worst job in the world because <laughs> you only do, your best job is invisible. The second somebody notices something, you've done it wrong. I'm too hot, I'm too cold, it's too breezy. Oh, it's not breezy enough. You know, it's like, I, we had a client that said, you know, my wife's from Texas and when it gets hot, she gets mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, again, we start with the client. That's their environment. It's their perspective and what's gonna bring them joy in their own house. So I think that's all our jobs. 
my job is, again, to try to be as invisible as possible. Fortunately, we have a great client who can, we get to throw things on him and say, oh, you want it to function that way? You get to do the controls <laughs> because they're not available. But because what our compromise as a team to provide warm floors, low energy, sort of on demand is to, we, again, it, the idea came from the contractor, it didn't come from me, was we're dedicating radiant zones to where you're actually gonna stand. And then leaving other areas bare so that, or, or less covered with radiant surfaces so that the ultimate impact of that hot water in the floor is reduced because yeah, David's totally right. That envelope is gonna be so nice and tight that I've worked on several passive houses that overheated. They're wonderful warm in the winter and then they overheat in the summertime and you can't get rid of it. So we had a client that was in the process of building his house, we're working on a Palo Alto. We weren't gonna do cooling at all. He called us from a brand new passive house that he bought in England and it was 102 in his living room. And he said, we're doing cooling, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I don't, so, but now we have equipment too that we can, we can squeeze it in, we can hide it. This is a project on Green Street in San Francisco that um, we can do multiple indoor units with air to air or air to water, hide it in the assemblies and the finished product, you don't see anything. So again, that's my job to try to make it as integrated, as invisible as possible, both thermally and, and visibly. Um, this is a project in Portola Valley that is completely heated and cooled from the floor. Um, that's the only mechanical system. It's hot and chilled water in the floor, but the steel structure radiates it through the building. So we have radiant, heated, and cool floors, and ventilation, and that's it. But it has lots of systems that are integrated into it, so we're relying on thermal solar, on air to water heat pumps, et cetera. So um, we only had, this is a, I threw this in for Dave, because on that lower left picture is outdoors. And this is like the most extreme thermal bridge that I've ever worked on. And, but it was a design decision. We couldn't put insulation and then cover it up. It's a, it's a concrete slab that extends to the exterior that's heated. So I've yet to ask them how often the animals outside congregate. Because they, have, <laughs> they have dogs and horses and on this property, and I'm sure that's where they hang out, out outside. Um, so quickly too, apart from the things that we're doing, working with Dave, part of his loads are the amount of fresh air that we have to bring in to keep his environment super clean because for a paint booth and for a wood shop with particulates in the air, we, we, have, we need lots of air changes and that means that brings a thermal load right there. So the envelope can be perfect, but if you change the air, you know, five to 10 times an hour in the middle of the winter, you have to deal with that. So actually some of our loads come, are coming from there. Um, this is a passive house office in Palo Alto, John Soupy's. And again, the, it's a testament to all the details where it's a 6,000 foot commercial office, architects and, and builder, and it has a single four ton uh, air to water heat pump and everything's heated and cooled from the ceiling through the Masana uh, radiant panels. Um, we did experiment with BioPCM for, uh, which is a, it's a vegetable uh, way of adding thermal mass. So the little pockets between the metal studs turns that wall into the equivalent of a 12 inch thick concrete wall in, in, in value of thermal mass because it, it has, a, has a low melting point. So during the day it melts and then at night it solidifies and cools down and it, it moderates that, moderates the temperature through the building. So that's the, 
the, the finished uh, building and the, there's a little thermal image showing the contrast of the panels and the temperatures. Um, the nice thing is, again, it's completely invisible. Um, so that's what we're striving with, with David's house, to give him all these systems that are on demand. If he needs it, it's available. If he doesn't need it, it reduces its own loads automatically. And it's all variable speed so that it, it will tread lightly if it, if it, it needs to. Um, I threw a few of these in uh, other ways of convectors and things that again, we now have access of integrating into architecture. And, uh, and so that's, that's my perspective. Awesome. Thank you. Philip, can we, um, I'm gonna have a hard time calling you a tool. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we call you an implementer or something? Like yeah, that? yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Right. I like that better. Yeah. Too. <laughs> support. I'm a support team. Yeah. We'll, we'll add it to your name tag, Philip the Implementer. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So, so next up is Divya. And uh, having created over 50 uniquely beautiful interior design projects in both India and the Bay Area, Divya brings global business and design expertise, expertise excuse me, to earthbound homes. Uh, early on in her career, she had the opportunity to work on several lead projects, uh, thus developing her skills and creating beautiful and functional spaces with an eye towards sustainability. Uh, she launched her own residential and commercial design build company called The Plan D in India, uh, whose award-winning designs were featured on numerous magazines, including Vogue magazine. Uh, her projects have received many awards, including a gold, uh, a gold award from ASID, Ooh. and uh, more recently, a Meta Platinum Award from Nari uh, 2021 for a whole house remodel. Uh, she loves to volunteer her time at Habitat for Humanity, USGBC events, and as a guest speaker on topics such as biomimicry and passive house design at West Valley College. Thank Take it away. Thank you for having us, everybody. I'm so excited to see all of you, and it's so fantastic to be a part of this panel, and uh, thank you all for having us. Um, so today, I want to talk a little bit about sustainable interior design in terms of what that means to a lot of us coming from the design field, uh, whether it is architecture or design. And you know, so for, for me, a few years ago, when I looked at sustainable design, it was like, oh my God, can I do this? Is it, you know, is, is, uh, am I going to be able to specify stuff? Am I going to, it, it's too much. Or it could be my client wants really high end, uh, you know, finishes, luxurious finishes. So you know, can I make it work with jute and hemp? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think um, a lot of you might feel that way too. And one of the things I wanted to share today and kind of talk through with you my journey, uh, which could also become yours, is how we can slightly modify the way we think about sustainable design and how we can approach it. Um, so to me, sustainable interior design is a harmony between earth and aesthetic. What does that mean? It's a balance, a process by which we create beautiful, modern, functional, all the words we know, uh, but also lessening our impact on the earth. That's the part that we add on, right? How can we do that? So today, in the later slides, it's, it's kind of, I want to share some resources and tools. So when you leave today, you can feel like this is something I can understand easily. It's not rocket science. I know sometimes it can feel like that. And also for you to feel that being a sustainable designer doesn't mean that you need to have a whole bunch of letters behind your name, like lead AP, uh, P, P, head CP, et cetera, which all of us do, but still, um, it, that, that's not the point, right? So let's move on. So there are components for us to think about. I know that there's a lot of stuff here, but just stay with me. So there are components that we can think about when we approach any new design, right? This will help us. It'll act like a guidance as we go through each of these to help us uh, funnel our thoughts in a certain direction in helping us in the design schematic process, in talking to our clients, and in selecting our materials and finishes. 
And a lot of these things that you see, you've already heard many times before, but I'm trying to make it more tangible for you um, with, with everything we're gonna discuss. So first, let's start off with energy efficiency, heating, lighting, big chunks. So energy, the lesser we can use, lesser fuel, lesser CO2. So very simplified, right? How does that, how can we do our bit here? Um, so heating, when, we're, when we are specifying windows, for example, let's look at good quality windows. Let's understand what that rating is. Window coverings, very simple, but used right, you can cut off so much of heat, which can you know, cool down a home. You don't need to use that much energy. Using smart thermostats, energy management systems can help the homeowner have it like in, on their phone, turn off, turn on appliances, which don't need to be running the whole day. There are smart plugs that you can use that can actually turn off um, you know, appliances that don't need to be on the whole day and just turn it on when you know you need them. Lighting, if we're doing remodels, we can switch out those halogens to LEDs. Um, we can also, when we're, when we're designing our interior spaces, just simple things like, you know, light, the, the paints that we choose, the lightness, the reflective surfaces, that decreases the amount of artificial light. Something, sometimes we forget these things, but these small little modifiers is, is all it takes um, in certain spaces. Um, smart charging, power strips. Now, the next one is waste reduction. Again, two, th two ways to think about this. One is construction, demo, uh, uh, when we're doing demolition at that stage. So a lot of pre-planning can help here. And what do I mean by that? So uh, let's say we're doing a large remodel, so a lot of deconstruction there, or if we are building a new home and we have a old home that needs to be removed, we can actually plan for um, a, uh, there are companies that will come in and do a whole strip of the house. What that means is they will take out, I know Sharon's looking at me like, I know all this information. I know Sharon, sorry. <laughs> it's for the rest of us. <laughs> but um, so these companies, they come in, they strip it all up. They, they segregate your, your windows, doors, your pipes. So that can be recycled, that can be sold, but this also saves cost to the client. How? Because what they have to demolish now is much lesser than what they started with. So it, it really, um, so cost-wise, pre-planning helps in that way. Repurposing, um, you know, from, from your remodel also helps. Another thing to think about waste reduction is after occupancy. How can we do that? We can help our clients by planning for things like composting, Simple things, right? But we can plan for a specific location in their kitchen that they can do it without having it to sit like on top of the counter uh, or using recyclable products. What do I mean by that? Simple rug, for example, after 10 years, you know, they want to toss it. Pick, pick a product that can be recycled, right? So that way it doesn't end up in the landfill. You can recycle it. So these are things that we think about early on in the project, but they make a huge difference to our environment that we live in. And those, this is the essence of a sustainable designer. Um, indoor air quality, huge for, for designers. Um, and even when we're in the design phase, it's huge for architects as well, thinking about fresh air circulation. Sometimes that's all you need. Two great place windows or doors, open them up and you're good for the whole summer, <laughs> right? Air crosses. <laughs> and and you, you have a great indoor air quality, fresh air, the HRV systems that we talked about, indoor plants, uh, and very important to specify products that don't off gas, things that we use all the time, paints, carpets, um, fabric, right? Mm -hmm. All uh, things that, cabinetry, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that. So those are some considerations in indoor air quality. Water conservation, EPA approved fixtures. So EPA is an environmental protection agency. Here's a fun fact. If every house in the United States replaced one faucet with a water efficient faucet, we would save 60 billion, billion gallons of water per year. Imagine in this room, if all the designers and architects, you know, we, each of us do so many projects per year. Imagine if we just specified, looked for 
a water efficient pro uh, product and specified it, right? The, the, we're lucky because right now they are easily available and a lot of them look beautiful. They fit in right with the aesthetic that we're going for. Um, low flow faucets, uh, durable pipes to prevent leaks. Let's put that extra dollar in so that we're not having leaky, um, you know, plumbing. And also um, having submeters wherever possible. What are submeters? What do they do? They calculate or they let you know how much water is used in different parts of the house. So if you have a very large house, it's helpful. How is this helpful? So you'll see a certain number every month. Suddenly you see that number spike. And it's not like you have five people visiting. So, you know, the water usage has not gone up. That easily lets you know that, hey, we have a leak or something's going on. Right, so that helps you early on figure out um, issues. Sustainable building materials. So again, this is thinking about the materials that go into these sort of um, uh, passive and non-passive buildings. Just, we wanna think about it very holistically, any project that we do, and that's the point of this whole slide, right? Um, timber instead of steel, why? Because steel has a lot of embodied carbon where, where, uh, that, that they were sharing with us before. Concrete reinforced with natural fibers. Con concrete again is, again is one of the largest producers of CO2. So when you add natural fibers to it, it not only makes it stronger, but it reduces the amount of concrete that you actually need. Uh, geotextile straw bales, we're actually working on another project that we're going to be doing the whole passive house wall insulation with straw bales. So it's it's becoming a thing back again, I should say. <laughs> um, and responsibly sourced FSC materials. Sustainable design. So the basic is start thinking early on, start planning early on that 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 will truly help you know, the, the process go easily and economically and socially, everybody will be, bring the whole team on board like this team is uh, into that process. And lastly is durability. Why durability? We, you know, obviously using materials that is going to last a long time just means that we don't have to rip stuff out and put new stuff in. Uh, design that is adaptable, counter height variations, so different uh, you know, kids, adults, uh, everybody can use that space. Burbless showers, you all know what that is, right? <laughs> Curbless showers. <laughs> it's a spelling error. I left that in there so we could laugh about it. <laughs> um, aging in place. Um, <laughs> So we want our houses to last a lifetime. And we're seeing that with the cost of houses, with older people, a lot of my clients, they want to live in their house. They do not want to go to facilities, right? And we're, uh, we're having to remodel a lot of the bathrooms uh, just so that they can do that and, and uh, reduce any level changes within the home. So when we are in this, this process of designing, remodeling or designing homes for, for clients, let's start thinking about those things, right? Um, and spaces that can be repurposed. So these are just components, they're guidelines for us to kind of keep in mind when we are uh, in the process of a remodel or a new home that can just help us. All right. So indoor air quality is huge, right, for us. Uh, because we specify a lot of those materials that go into the client's house. So the red list was actually developed by ILFI. ILFI is the International uh, Living Future Institute. And what their goal is to uh, help create the most healthy buildings in the world on the planet. Um, and they created, they came up with the Living Building Challenge to help people, um, you know, build these homes and come up with ideas. So the list, red list has grown beyond this program and we are using it uh, now to, to give us guidance on the chemicals that we want to stay away from. So if you kind of look uh, down at that list, you will know some of these like asbestos, formaldehyde, chlorobenzenes, uh, VOC, etc. So, so, okay, what's so bad about these chemicals. I'm just going to focus on one. Uh, for example, formaldehyde. So formaldehyde, we have, how many people have here heard about it, um, that it's not good for us? Okay. So formaldehyde is classified by the International Agency for Research on Cancer in the state of California. It's a human carcinogen. It causes cancer. Okay. Common health effects, 
at low exposure, now they're talking about just low exposure, right? To this VOC includes irritation, sensitization, and it acts as an asthma trigger. Long-term exposure, living in a house for 50 years, is associated with nasal cancers, leukemia. Now, how many of you knew that? There's four or five hands. Now, how many of you would actively specify a product that includes that? Nobody. So, so that's the point, right? That is the information that I want you to be able to access, right? Um, is, okay, red, red list, if you guys go online, you can access this list. And okay, now formaldehyde. Now, how do, can any of you tell me in what building products that we use indoors, you can find formaldehyde in? Sheet goods. Plywood, sheet goods, mm -hmm. wallpapers, fabric, cabinetry. So it's a lot. A, lo a lot of stuff. I'll explain it. It's a lot of stuff that we specify on a daily basis almost. And that's why we need to know a little bit more about this. So um, the, the next few slides, my intent in the next few slides is again to share some resources where you guys can go on your own time and, and dig through and get this knowledge that I'm talking about. Today, we're not going to go over everything it's too much, but you, you can be able to do that. And that's the point here. So uh, homefree.healthybuilding.net and uh, mindful materials. These are just some options that I've, I've, I've uh, you know, showcased here, but there are, uh, there are many other websites. Mindful materials, it helps you uh, select uh, products more for the commercial side. I don't think there are too many commercial people here, so I will focus on um, uh, home free. So it has, as you can see under products, if you go, it has all these different um, icons that we use every day, flooring, paint, drywall, countertops, all of this. Now, why am I showing you this? Um, we talked about formaldehyde. We had a question on in plywood. What do you mean? So what does that mean? So if you do click on uh, uh, the cabinetry and mill work, you come to this site. I know there's a lot of information, but the point is go home and check it out. But visually, you'll know what is there. What can you find on this website, right? So composite wood, so on, on the right, I'm, I'm reading the first, um, uh, the first part. Here's some general guidance to use when choosing cabinetry and millwork. So it's guidance for people like us, right? What we need to know. So prefer solid wood materials over composite. Why? Because wood does not off-gas. Just wood by itself is not going to go off-gas. Composite materials, what is that? That is your plywood because you're you're putting pieces together even more composite is particle board mdf what's in this stuff so the particle board is basically little pieces which are held together by a resin that resin has a lot of formaldehyde which off gases over the period of its lifetime right so if you choose a cabinetry that has formaldehyde and put it in a house it's going to start um, off gassing. So, okay, that's scary. What do we do? Uh, opt for plywood over other composite uh, where possible. So what happens is plywood are these sheets and they get glued together. So the amount of resin that's in them is way less. So it's like um, uh, plywood has about 2% or something while composite wood has about 10% of formaldehyde that's in it, right? It's a, there's a huge variation. When using composite wood, specify uh, materials that are NEF, no added formaldehyde or ultra low emitting formaldehyde. Okay, so what does this mean? Specify. We all work with manufacturers. Ask them. Ask them because that's what's going to get them to really start thinking about this stuff more. They're already thinking about it. But when you ask them, they will, be, they will have to deliver product and that's how we change the building um, you know, industry too. Um, prefer products that are factory finished. Why? Because the, the, the finishing happens in enclosed areas. So it's much safer for the people uh, working there and for the environment because it all happens inside a, a, a closed facility. You don't want that finishing to happen in the house as much as possible. Um, 
prefer solid wood veneer over laminate and thermofoil because laminate and thermofoil also use uh, resin which is and hence formaldehyde and prefer products with full disclosure. So the reason I'm showing you this is it just gives you information. It gives you knowledge. It gives you, it empowers you. Um, and then you can get, a, so everything I explained, I actually learned from a website like this at some point, right? And you, you, I want you to have that and feel um, that you can know this stuff too. Uh, paints, again, just I just took another example. This one actually gives you a reference to the ones that you can use directly. So you don't have to go and you know uh, uh, look for stuff, search for stuff. Um, and then this last one is just pretty pictures to show you that we hmm. can have beautiful, sustainable materials, wallpaper from FSE certified sources, EcoSpec is Benjamin Moore's latest product. Um, and that is uh, Technofloor, is, which is a biourethane uh, flooring. Instead of LVT, you can use that product, um, hmm. lime plaster. So pretty pictures, we can do this. The building, the building, you guys, so when I was at Greenbelt, one thing I want to just let you know is um, one, one, of, one of the manufacturers told us that you guys kept asking us for this, for a sustainable product for so long that we just had to make it. So, you know, there's always that question, what comes first? Should the building uh, manufacturers change first? Should, should the clients know their stuff first or, so we play a huge role, you know, in, in, in making that change happen, in, in guiding and uh, giving knowledge to our clients, as well as requesting, demanding for products from our vendors too. So thank you. <laughs> so last but not least is uh, Dave Edwards, PhD of Earthbound Homes and co uh, co-chair. Co I have the pleasure of working with Dave uh, this year and prior. Um, so Dr. Dave Edwards, he received his PhD back in 1999 uh, in biochemistry and cell biology. Uh, he worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a few years uh, before deciding to start Earthbound Homes in 2002. He's a certified green building professional, lead AP, certified passive house trains, trades person, excuse me, HERS Raider and Green Point Raider. Um, and uh, I'd be remiss without saying that he uh, lives in his very own uh, green Point rated home. Uh, the let me make sure I'm getting this right here. I believe the most points in uh, California, if not the whole U.S., with 315 points. So, so an <laughs> impressive residence he has on his own. Um, and uh, he is currently, uh, let's see, forgive me. He is currently working on uh, two uh, other passive house projects with a few more in the works. So this is one one of several. So take it away, Dave. Thank you. So uh, I'm not gonna wax on too uh, long. Uh, the thing I wanted to kind of focus on here is that uh, it is a group of people that makes these projects. Any one person, uh, architect, without a builder that's, uh, that's kind of abiding by their plans and without a, an HVAC designer that is helping uh, make the building a big, uh, efficient, functional unit, um, you have to work together and you have to start as early as possible. Everybody brings something in, no matter what your, what your role in the, in, the, um, in the group is, whether it's the homeowner or the architect or the builder. Uh, we all have to collaborate together and we have to talk about these things. Uh, you know, building a passive house is a community fair and it's not that kind of community where it's all the same thing. I mean, I think David really really eloquently said it at the very beginning of the talk, that this is about understanding his goals from the very beginning and then implementing his goals. And sometimes a client comes to us without the goal of a passive house. And for very often they've never heard of, of green building in the aspects of green building that we know about indoor air quality, about durability, about efficiency of utilization of materials or water. And part of, of our role as professionals in this industry is we know this and we can help explain how the things that we know how to do can increase the, the quality of life or the quality of the house for the homeowner. And a big part of that is this learning how to speak the homeowner's language, which means listen. Ask questions and listen. And then ask questions so that you really understand what their goal is for the project and then try to come up with ways to improve the quality of their project. Um, 
One of the things that we really focus on is asking questions, listening, and then really doing all of the heavy lifting of the project design before we ever start construction. It's too late when you start construction. So you'll notice in the left, the arrows all point towards a happy client and a happy architect and a happy building uh, system and an effective construction process. And that comes from designing the house before you start building the house. Uh, the, the triangle in the upper right hand corner is really that, that three part uh, triangle of the builder, the design professionals, and the homeowner or the building owner or the manager of the building and all understanding and speaking together before construction starts. And what I really love about the bottom right hand corner, it's called the McLearney curve. And if you don't know, McLearney is the uh, CEO of HOK Architects. He's American, an AIA fellow. And he came up with this uh, curve that basically says that the standard process, this kind of design, and then all of the CDs get built in the underneath the blue loop or the blue uh, curve. That really puts the decision-making process very far into construction document development, where then it's very difficult to make changes. And it's very, it gets very expensive. If we take all that learning, all that evolution of the design, and we move it as far towards the beginning of the project, making changes that result in a client's getting a better project, a, a more functional project, a more cost-effective project becomes a lot, lot easier and it becomes less, of, less expensive. So Divya touched upon this a little bit before, but um, we are really into, I mean, as you heard, uh, my education is, is in kind of health and uh, avoiding toxic chemicals in projects is incredibly important to us. And the no added formaldehyde is the start and it's about education, it's about doing your research, it's about asking for declare documents. So uh, this is more common in, in commercial than it is residential, but companies that are trying to promote their green bona fides are gonna start announcing the kind of health consequences of the chemicals that they put into their materials, and that's through the declare documents. And not very many companies do this. We have to be asking those questions, asking, what is in your, in your product that you're trying to sell me that I'm gonna put into my homeowner or my building owner's building that potentially could off gas for 10 or 20 years, right? We have to ask those questions. It is endemic upon us to take responsibility, to protect our clients, to protect the building occupants, because we know from multiple scientific studies that the more healthy, the greener, and I don't very often use green in this group, I will, but the greener the project is, the happier the occupants are. People work better in green buildings with good daylighting and good air conditioning and good air quality. They are happier individuals and more so in the house. Um, this is all about bringing value to this process. So we are not designers. We are builders. We are implementers uh, to <laughs> kind of extend off of what Philip's role is, right? We are the guys or women that are trying to put together the designs of the building professionals in the best way possible. Part of that is thinking about how much this project costs. Now we talked about budget a little bit, but everybody has a budget. Thinking about the best ways to use our clients dollars is really, really important because very often the things that get excluded are the things that make the benefit to the client the greatest. Insulation, quality of windows, quality of materials, the potential off-gassing, the quality of their uh, heating and cooling system, all that's incredibly important. If we're burning a bunch of money uh, building an overly strong building that has a ton of steel that thermally doesn't function very well, when we could do the same thing with, uh, with mass timber or with other materials, we, we have a responsibility to, to present that to our clients and to our architects and building officials, I mean, building uh, engineers and things like that to reduce the embodied carbon of these materials. And those questions need to be asked early. The earlier they're asked, the easier they are for the, the designers to implement into the construction process. If we ask them just before we start construction, the costs go way up. The difficulty of implementing those materials goes way up. We have a responsibility for everybody to ask these questions early. 
So what are we bringing to it? Well, we understand that there's benefits that the architects, the clients, the interior designers, the engineers aren't gonna understand. Deconstruction, the value of donating materials so that other people can use those building materials for building houses that they may not have the, the resources to buy brand new materials. Taking all this material and instead of putting it in a landfill, putting it in somebody's home. That's a real value, that's a real reuse that everybody can appreciate. And the client can actually get uh, tax, ref uh, tax uh, deductions by donating these materials. Um, we are constantly exposed to building materials that maybe other people in the building part, in the building, in the design field are not exposed to. This is a material that I absolutely love. It's made from recycled glass. They essentially, they, they uh, melt recycled glass, they blow air into it, and it makes essentially volcanic glass. You can then take that volcanic glass, replace the, the rock underneath slabs, and it insulates the slabs. So now you get rid of all the foam that you would normally put under a slab to give you an insulated warm floor. This actually costs less than rock. And when we looked at it with this project, the only problem was that the only manufacturer was in Maine. And it was gonna cost twice as much to ship it from Maine to California as the product itself costs. They are actually opening up a facility in the Central Valley starting in January. Hmm. Right? So like this is what happens when the market speaks and the market asks for these materials. Um, things about, for instance, radon. So I understand from uh, my research and, and you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and I learn something every day. I understand that the peninsula is actually a fairly high radon area and it is important for us to include radon mitigating uh, construction, uh, construction methods within our projects, this costs a fraction uh, of a dollar. I mean, it costs dollars, but a fraction of what the project costs, like a tiny, tiny little bit, and yet it can save the client from having radon fill up their basements. That's real value that we bring to our projects. And I would, I would like to finish by saying that uh, this is all about collaboration, but it's all about uh, improving the planet, improving our clients' uh, homes, improving our industry, improving the projects that we build here. That's by asking questions, by introducing materials, by not accepting the way we did it 20 years ago or the way my grandpappy did it 15, 50 years ago. That's part of this evolution. And we don't move the ball unless we ask the questions and push the envelope. Um, and I just actually like to finish up by saying, uh, I am incredibly proud to be a part of this project. This is 20 years of, of research and uh, building greener and greener projects. This project, Chris was exactly right. This has a lot of, a lot of scope. There's a lot of, of demand on this project. That's part of what makes it fun, but you don't actually have to start on a project like this, right? Start small, start by specifying uh, no added formaldehyde cabinets. Start by specifying more insulation or better windows or not vinyl flooring, but a, a material that uses castor oil instead of vinyl. You don't have to start at a passive house. Start small and work your way up and build the skills and build the education that you need to make better projects. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panelists here. So we're gonna jump into some Q&A. Um, I've got a couple questions here, but I definitely want to pull uh, the folks here for questions as well. So yeah, Janine, do you wanna, do you wanna start with one right, right off the bat? Let me come to you. <laughs> All right, thank you. That was a lot, but it was very useful and inspiring. So my question is, we're talking about all the things that we can do. My question is mechanically, so Dave, Eric, and, and Philip. Philip. So are there built-in redundancies? So if something mechanically fails, um, is, are there redundancy systems in place to kick in? And are you measuring it? <laughs> you know, actually you brought up a point that, that I'm, on a, I'm gonna enlist David to do because it's something that a lot of companies have done different kinds of monitoring, um, but we need a cheap and easy and effective and comprehensive way of tracking how things perform. 
Well, I, and, and I'm sure David's going to be monitoring everything, um, but we do because we're both heating water, chilling water with air to water heat pumps. Part of the strategy of maintaining the stasis with passive house, but giving some of the creature comforts that David's looking for is we're heating the floors, we're cooling the cooling the air, but we're doing it in a really tight temperature gradient so that with his own energy that he's producing, so there's no guilt there, but we're doing it at a, at a temperature point where the heat pumps now go from 300% efficient to 500% efficient. You, you, by, by keeping those temperatures at the most, at their best performance. And, and so, because when we debated it and said, well, how can, you heat, how can you heat the floor and cool the air? That doesn't make sense. That's a waste of energy. But when you look at it, you're operating at, at these little peak performance levels of, of the equipment and in a, in a narrow margin, it's, that's how we're trying to achieve that goal. I think actually David should speak to the measure it part. Yeah, definitely. It's really important. So uh, I'm really into measurement. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I write software uh, that uh, gets distributed on uh, millions of vehicles across the world. And uh, one of the most difficult things in my job is knowing what's actually happening in the vehicle in order for the automation that I'm writing to actually work. And uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in the perfect job because I love, uh, I love writing software that monitors stuff. And uh, I'm, building a, I'm building my own thermostat. Uh, there'll be, I call it the sensor pack. It goes in, there's one in every room. Um, and uh, it will, of course, measure the current temperature. But in addition to that, it uh, uh, measures uh, particle concentration, uh, CO2 concentration, uh, occupancy, of course. I mean, that's pretty standard these days, but uh, so that, that'll be in there. Um, humidity. Noise level? Uh, yes, actually, <laughs> noise level. Attitude. <laughs> <laughs> um, and VOCs uh, and uh, a few other variables. Uh, and uh, it will do it on a small controller board that uh, is it's, uh, not going to be cheap. I, I estimate about uh, 50 bucks uh, per uh, unit. Um, but uh, it's uh, all going, all that, uh, all the sensor packs will then report to uh, a central automation computer. And that automation computer will drive the, uh, the, uh, the HVAC system as well as the lights. We hope, excuse me. So Dave, I have to say, we have to appreciate uh, the fact that you measure, the fact that you are interested in all of these variables. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's probably fair to say that some of our clients may have the same ideals, but may not be as invested in the measuring. Mm -hmm. And I think um, convincing those that we work with, either al alongside or, or that we're working for, um, it's important to, to get them on board, right? And I think mm -hmm. health seems like one of those common factors. I was wondering if maybe I could go around the around the uh, the panel here a little bit, or if anybody wants to start to talk about how you approach convincing those you work with alongside those you're working for to to pursue these measures, right? Even if they aren't uh, so so clear on the why. Anybody want to start off with that? So, um, you know, I, one of the things that uh, that we have to do is as a designer or architect is really understand the client. And like Dave mentioned, how do you do that is by asking a lot of questions. The only way you can get a client to do something that you think is important for them is helping them understand why it is important for them. What do I mean by that is we want great indoor air quality. Not everyone is going to understand how that's going to impact <clears throat> their life, right? So by talking to them about kids, allergies, asthma, do any of you have it at home? Yeah. So when you, so when you find those touch points that 
are important to them. That what mm-hmm. that's what's going to bring them on board into elements that um, you know are good for them, the environment. So a lot of it has to be knowledge, sharing that knowledge, and also asking a lot of questions to understand uh, what makes them tick. Mm-hmm. I don't have anything to add to that. Yeah. You, you know, we, years ago, we, we had this amazing contact, a man who was a palm collector. And he was 19th century sort of attitude. He collected palm trees. Oh, palm, he had trees. palm trees. Palm trees. Rare <laughs> specimens. <laughs> yeah, palms. That's not yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> and he probably had in his collection $20 million worth of palm trees, which some of which he sold to Frankfurt. But when I asked him when he, how he decided on where to plant a tree in his own property, and it took him years to find just the right property, he said, you know, when I see a specimen out in the wild, he used to go to Madagascar a lot, and, and he'd say, I'd spend the day, I'd lay down under that tree, and I watch the sun go by, and I feel the breezes, and I could touch the earth. It has to be that tactile. I mean, I, architects do this. I know architects that will spend days out on a, in the field sketching and coming back with four by six cards of, of sketches. And one in particular I really respect. At, when the project was finished, we held up one of the cards and it was as if he did it that day. And he did it two years before the building was ever started. That's awesome. You know, so that kind of observation and connection with the client. Because I always, I, the first question I always ask people is, how hot is hot? Mm-hmm. You get a different definition from everyone. Yep. So how hot is hot? How cold is cold? What do you feel when you have a breeze on you or not? Everyone is so different. And so placement of things and colors and, you know, it's that's the process that you have to, implement I would say you know Feldman Architecture is a 35 person firm we do 90% of our work is is single family residents um, far and away the most successful thing we've done to get our clients to do sustainable buildings uh, was educate our staff um, everyone including the person you just hired needs to speak the same language you do. Um, and they need to speak it confidently and they need to know it. Um, you can't have one or two point people in your office selling something that they're not there 99% of the time. So it's really important that everyone just get educated on it. And it is, a lot of it, it's really simple stuff. It's not rocket science. Um, it takes a little bit of time, and it's something that every client will want, if they're, even if they don't know it. You know, mm-hmm. the, is indoor air quality important to you? Of course it is, right? And it's one of those levers, one of thousands of levers we have over the course of a project to control. Um, and there's budgets on every project, um, but we control all those levers, and we just have to be asking the right questions. I'd actually like to segue off of that for just a second. So um, we're actually starting a Bay Area Building Science uh, Collaborative. Uh, first meeting is January 25th uh, in 2023 to, to talk about specifically building science, right? To introduce all the topics that kind of combine into building science so that we can make it a safe, fun, educational place. And it'll be Sometimes it'll be office meetings and sometimes it'll be job site meetings, whether it's residences or commercial buildings. Sometimes we'll have uh, uh, companies come in and talk about their, uh, uh, what they're, they're building for the, the construction industry. But uh, you know, it's about education, just exactly like Chris said. Um, we emphasize education with all of our people. When we come into the organization, you have to get trained in this because If one person doesn't understand it and the client asks them and they can't explain it, like, why should I do this? I don't know. (laughs) Well, what does that do to your message, right? So. I think I'll open it back up to the crowd. Are there any other questions? Sounds good. I think.
Uh, real quickly for um, Dave Edwards or anybody else, um, it's kind of two part. Can you talk a little bit about um, in the passive house and windows and doors? Um, you also talked about insulation. Can you kind of describe um, what the difference is in a passive house in the windows and doors uh, versus like your regular custom home and what makes it so? How, how is it quiet or how, what, is, what is that process or you know, what does that look like? Should I take that? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> so um, actually they have some really good, um, super high efficiency uh, sections of glass over here and, and frames. TBS does, yes. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it is, uh, it, it's kind of like the difference between a front door and a, and a bank vault. Right? Like literally you look <laughs> at a standard, you know, I'm not going to name any company names, but some standard American windows. And there are passive house windows that are made in the United States, but the standard two pane windows that we've been installing in our projects and specifying in projects for, for decades and decades look flimsy and tiny and thin compared to these high quality thermally broken uh, windows. I mean, we're talking three panes. The glass is an inch thick, not, you know, just over half an inch thick. Um, they were, they perform on the kind of the minimum two times better. So a hundred percent better than a standard window. You can get passive house windows that are, uh, 300 times, 300% better than a standard R3, uh, U 0.3 style window. You can get R10, R11, R12 windows. So just think about uh, a window as a hole in the house and the R value is the size of the hole. So imagine making a hole in the house a third the size, how much more energy efficient your house gets. And what's really important, in, and I think this is really kind of integral, is that the difference between a good quality house and a passive house is about 2.7% cost. 2.7%. A big portion of that is the windows. But you can buy a two-pane high end, I'm not going to mention names again, American window, or you can buy a three pane, super efficient, highly durable passive house window for the same price, right? So the windows are the weakest part of the building envelope. And they're also by far the most impactful when you upgrade them to the windows. And I would, I would highly recommend that if you've never seen one that you go over here and look at these, they are amazing compared to what you're normally going to consider uh, as a window that we put into our houses. Uh, and if you have to lift them up and install them, especially in a light well, they, you will really understand the difference in the, in the windows. Mm -hmm. But it is uh, a dramatic difference, and I, I urge you to lay hands on because it's a pretty spectacular experience. And to piggyback on that, uh, thank you so much, Dave, because we are, TBS is on the mission to truly... Uh, educate our trade on um, energy efficiency and even take it further in when we uh, work with uh, beautiful designs uh, our job is to consult and uh, what I'm seeing homeowners when they come to us a lot of homeowners find us uh, after their building has been completed to protect their glass uh, externally so I see that happening uh, quite often lately. Um, so thinking also further in when you have large openings, be it window and door, also protecting it from the exterior, not interior shading solutions, but exterior. Mm -hmm. And we have those solutions and we have multiple passive house projects that we are helping uh, consult on the products. And we're also help installing because these systems mm -hmm. are not easy to install and the right installers must uh, do diligent of the work to make it so it works properly. So thank you so much for raising the awareness mm -hmm. about that. Um, and, and I have a point actually in, in regards to windows and, and also pulling two concepts together of both efficiency and how do you sell it? And you sell it by, like I did a lead platinum building in San Francisco. We took a hundred year old Queen Anne building and ended up with a lead platinum rated building. And the room that the owner spent the most time in his office, he was uncomfortable. And it was the one room 
he insisted on keeping the original window. And he said, now the temperature's all off. How did you do, how, you, you screwed up. The, the, you know, I'm uncomfortable in this room. So we measured the air temperature in the whole house and it was one degree different in the whole house, but there's this concept of operative temperature and mean, mean radiant temperature. You can be sitting in a 72 degree room and you have a 50 degree window behind you, you're cold, you know, because the first law of thermodynamics, heat, it moves from hot to cold. So the heat in your body goes to the window and all of a sudden your skin is cold. Hmm. So how do you sell that window? You want to be comfortable, you know? And so that's how you draw, you know, it's easy. Then they go, oh, duh. <laughs> I believe there were, um, you had your hand raised. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this fabulous project to us. Um, I remember at the beginning, David mentioned that the Tesla solar roof. Uh, I was at the Green Build uh, conference at the beginning of this month, and I learned that there are other manufacturers. They also uh, they launched their product with the integrated uh, solar system or solar roof roofing system. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, have you done any research, like, compare different uh, products? Like, what was the decision on using the Tesla solar roofing system for your uh, <laughs> passive house? Uh, when I first started planning the project, it was really only Tesla. That was the only option. Uh, and so I uh, placed an order uh, pretty early. And, uh, and now that there are options, I'm also starting to look around because uh, Tesla doesn't seem to have uh, enough um, uh, manufacturing capacity to make as many roofs as, as people want. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, yeah, the alternatives uh, might even be cheaper. I, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, tell you guys a fun story on that manufacturer? So I was at Greenville, talked to this manufacturer. Um, so they make uh, shingles, roofing shingles, and they have gone into making shingles in integrated PV. And mm -hmm. he told me, hey, we're the largest manufacturer of shingles in the US. And uh, when Elon came along and started making um, uh, PV, uh, you know, uh, we were like, he's going to take our jobs. So let's also start doing research and let's get our product out. That's what happens, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's us pushing, all these kind of pushes makes manufacturers start developing. Uh, but that was just a fun story. Mm -hmm. to, to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just on a real quick, on a cost standpoint, because we, we weren't sure we were going to be able to get the Tesla product for this, for this project. And course budget always comes up and the cost of doing the Tesla roof was actually significantly less than to do a standard roof with solar panels mm -hmm. so um, yeah glad it worked out and we have put on uh, built it's called building integrated PV so we put it on standing seam roofs we put it on tile roofs before uh, so there are products out there mm -hmm. as far as we've seen we've not had any complaints about them we've again we're getting the benefit of of using David's house as the first for the Tesla roof, but we're excited about it. I think mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the future because it doesn't compromise the architectural aesthetic as much as putting what a lot of people consider big, ugly panels on a roof. Mm -hmm. Most of the previous ones were thin film. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they weren't as efficient. You could argue they have a different spectrum that they react to. So they start earlier and work later, but, at, but the net net is you still need a much bigger surface to get the same effect. I think we're just about at time. Do we have a time for a few more questions? Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us tonight. Um, I had a question about the radiant heat. Um, you touched on the, on the fact that you had radiant heat and cooling. How are you achieving that in one system? And are you having any problems with condensation? Uh, in, we actually do a lot of projects that are radiant cooled. Um, you, you control the condensation by 
constantly monitoring and calculating the dew point. Mm -hmm. So um, the ideal, this is actually where the marriage of passive house is pretty significant because if you have a cooling load at all in a passive house is great because the loads are so low. Uh, you can chill a floor all day long, get nine BTUs of cooling without even worrying about condensation because you're going to run it at 65 degrees and not even think about it. The problem is when you have the wall of west facing glass and you have big loads and now you need it to be on the ceiling and you need the ceiling to be 55, 58 degrees. Now you're running the risk of condensation. So if you if you have a clam bake in that room, <laughs> you're not going to chill. You're not going to chill it as you normally would. You're not going to get the same capacity. So what you do is you monitor it, and then it, you lower the temperature, or the, you know, you raise the temperature so you don't cross the dew point. Um, but in David's case, both to to have air air filtration, cooling, and a radiant component. We're actually doing the cooling with air, but the vehicle is water. So we're still using water to deliver or remove those BTUs. So do you have two systems, meaning ducting as well as the radiant? And fan coils. So we okay. have fan coils so and, and radiant circuits in the floor. Do you find this um, more feasible in California than in, let's say, the Midwest states? I only ask because I do a lot of Midwest projects as well. You know, it all, it all comes down to the, the particular load of the building. Mm -hmm. um, because you can have a traditional building that has, you know, 20, 25% glazing, as opposed to a real contemporary house that can have 70% glazing. And it can be in a severe climate with the right insulation. I mean, Passive House flourishes in, in Alaska, in the Midwest, you know. And if you have a, a moderate load because you have a good envelope, it's super successful and it's really reasonable. The other advantage you have in the Midwest is you actually have ground source heat pumps that are really reasonable because your drilling is so much cheaper. I mean, we try to do it here. I mean, in our climate, the temperatures make air to air more economical as opposed to drilling. So we can do ground source here, but the cost is just much more for the labor. And so I do ground source heat pumps every day. Yeah. You're talking geothermal. Right. Comparison. Yeah. It's the same device. It's just instead of expelling the heat to the air, you're expelling it to, to the water you know, into the ground or to water, like a pond. Um, th some systems are coming online now with, that are single phase that actually do that within the same system. So if you have a building that has diversity, say you have a cold basement and a hot second floor, with the same heat pump, you can redirect that heat. Instead of just throwing it away outdoors, you actually direct it so you cool the upstairs, and via that refrigerant cycle, you send the heat down to the basement and heat the basement. But right now it's limited. There's a few companies doing, mostly it's three-phase commercial. And you need a really significant cooling load to be able to make it feasible to send that heat somewhere else. I think I speak for all of us that we could probably stay here you know, another two hours, <laughs> keep listening to you guys. Um, but I think we're going to close it out with one last lightning round question that I want to ask, ask to each of you. Um, so starting with you, Philip, and we'll work our way yeah. down. I want to ask each of you, what are you going to do on your next project or what might you do on your next house uh, based on what you learned from this project? Either do it again or do it different for next time. Um, I might have the courage to tell that contemporary architect to reduce the glazing just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Christian. I've never done it, and all my compliance work running Title 24, I've had projects ta I taken over for other people that said, no, you have to do all these things, and I've got it to work. But um, no, I think, I think um, just being mindful of, of all the ramifications of orientation. Um, 
And again, you can still have that west view, but maybe a fantastic tree here and there framing the view, we can cut down 20% of the load, you know, and still have a beautiful big piece of glass. How about you, Divya? Oh, not, not by a lot near the Cal train. <laughs> <laughs> That's just kidding. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Um, for this project, particularly because of the acoustics, we developed kind of a double wall assembly um, that is a super high performing uh, thermal wall, but it's also, um, uh, it was developed for the acoustical side of things. And I think the solution that Dave helped us get to in terms of how to insulate it, um, we're basically using uh, cellulose to kind of block fill the entire wall. While the acoustics team was actually asking for an air gap, what we realized that cellulose doesn't really conduct sound. Um, so we, we, we just got an incredibly efficient wall that just performs wonderfully acoustically. And um, yeah, I could see us using this on, on, on a lot of projects that, are, um, that have noise sensitivity or we're just looking to go the extra mile in terms of thermal performance. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I see uh, when I move into the house, it's going to be a, what I call version 1.0 of the automation system and, and oh, yeah. part, part of the goal of building the house was so that I could have the lifelong project of tuning that system. <laughs> and so it's going to have a 2.0 and a 3.0, but all in the same house. The next version, the whole house is a flight simulator. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, we are actually incredibly fortunate to um, be working on uh, a straw bale house uh, two miles from David's house. Uh, that's also going to be passive house, and uh, we're going to go for multiple living building challenge pedals. Uh, so we are unbelievably fortunate. Excellent. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, AIA, ASID, and most importantly, TBS Gallery for hosting us this evening. Thank you, everybody, for coming.